what people are talking about is another another go at Donald Trump. Yes, I mean it's weird, isn't it? Because the thing that that struck me most today, reading all about this second attempted assassination on Donald Trump. This one took place on his golf course in West Palm Beach on Sunday, um, and he was not hit this time. Um, although he was within three to five hundred yards of a rifle with just a, scope. a long drive, as he would say. Well, indeed, but I mean, uh, as yeah. the sheriff, the local yeah. sheriff pointed out, I mean that is that is not a hard kill shot. No, no, right. So that if this this guy, Ryan Wesley Routh, um, of which perhaps more and on, um, had managed to fire one off, I mean, he, again, he could be dead. But what was interesting to me about some of the reaction was my my favourite. Uh, way of describing it was in the, the Telegraph, which is hardly a Marxist uh, new, newspaper, nope. which described it as the latest attempt. Yeah, like just one of just many you know a, yeah. another day at the office. Well, um, who was it? Was it his son that said, "My dad's running out of lives." Uh, yes, and, yes. Uh, and maybe there is a sort of sense of 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 that. You know. Well, I mean, th- th- there are, there are so many things to say about this. I mean, I suppose to get the sort of boring logistics out the way at the top it emerged that trump has a bubble around him of, of secret service people um which in in his most exposed situation which is when he plays golf amounts to two holes ahead of him two, right. two right and at the press conference after the um failed assassination attempt the local sheriff said well you know um if he was a serving president he would have closed the whole golf course right. but so clearly I mean, I think now that he's had two attempts on his life, yeah. it might be a presidential stroke vice presidential thing just to order the Secret Service to give him and Kamal Harris yeah. full full blown protection. full blown as yeah, if yeah. they were president. Because yeah. clearly, we you know we are in a very very tense situation where assassination yeah. attempts are um, not routine, but they are happening. I mean, I know everybody says you know, and Trump has said fantastic i'm so proud of the law enforcement the secret yes. service and all of that. but it, it is absolutely astonishing that the most powerful nation in the world with this reputation yes. for hyper security and the and hyper capabilities have let some wacko kid climb acro- across a roof in line of yes. sight of punters and actually shoot him yes and then a few weeks later a wacko 58 year old 58 year old with an ak-47 who's obsessed with ukraine on a golf course two two holes away from him yes and I they mean, and they spot what a, a, a rifle they sticking out of a bush and you know he'd, he'd got a gopro camera so yeah. obviously what he intended to do was to live stream do the whole thing the assassination yeah. i mean can you imagine where we'd be right now if that if it had gone ahead oh. and so i do think that the, the first thing that should be done is just by um, an executive order from the White House, Harris and Trump should be given full yeah. presidential standard security, at least for the duration yeah. of the campaign. I mean, there isn't. I mean, also there is another way of looking at it, which is, you know, if he's that vulnerable, then he shouldn't be playing golf as much as he's playing. You know, he shouldn't be open in the countryside. Yes, and I think I think that if, you know, well, you see, the, but, but that the two things go together because when you are subject to full presidential uh, security, uh, secret service protection, you are not allowed to do certain things. Yeah. So he would probably only be allowed to go to one golf course and yeah you know like a small crazy golf a cra- <laughs> yeah, who a can crazy say golf course but i mean he he's his liberty is is yeah, dependent on his bit, yeah. his level yeah. so so that's the kind of sort of logistics and procedural side of it yeah but the reaction's much more interesting it is it? much more and, and i guess there are two poles of response aren't there uh at the one one end there's those who echoing malcolm x after uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination sort of say chickens coming home to roost really yeah, which is yeah. basically uh, what did he expect yeah uh, and at the other end there are people who who say this guy Ryan Wesley Routh like the the, the the guy who tried to kill Trump and was shot on July 13th they're just lone wolves nothing to worry about and I think both responses are wrong actually and what what you have to do is is look at the environment and the poison that is now running through the bloodstream of uh, American politics and and indeed not just American politics but specifically in this case and you know acknowledge that 
guardrails that used to exist in American democracy um, are tumbling down. Now, there have been violent periods. The 1960s was one of them. But there's never been anything quite like this, I think, but where, you know, the, the level of hateful rhetoric and the level of, um, of armaments and militias, the level of um, antagonistic discourse is just so powerful yeah even what even during the height of the civil rights well i think i think that's the only comparable yeah, yeah. period but of course the difference then was there was no internet yeah and so what, what what that was about was undoubtedly um highly motivated individuals and groups query with help from you know uh, groups unknown i mean we you know the, the debate on who killed who and why yeah. in the 60s rages to this day and probably will rage for decades if not centuries yeah. but what what you have here is a situation where everyone exists on this continuum of anger um, which is a terrible way to conduct a presidential work, ter terrible way to conduct anything but um, it's a terrible way to conduct an election to decide the most powerful person in the free world yeah um but that is where we are and th there was a woman on radio 4 uh, at lunchtime saying a professor of somewhere and outlining what it seemed to me to be a very simplistic argument too simplistic saying that the christian right had been on a, a spree of othering pe groups of people and had and had created this atmosphere of violence where lashing out is now permissive yeah and and that and, and and in a sense, what does he expect? You know, if everybody's now well, that's chickens coming out. home to yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, the problem with this, and I I think it's very important to acknowledge that it is asymmetric. You know, the the there is no doubt that the MAGA side of the house has contributed more to the atmosphere of violence than the other side of the house. But no it's, question. Yeah. But you know, there there are some interesting things. I mean, one is um, there was a poll done by the University of Chicago in June, so quite recently, which found that ten percent of Americans think that, quote, the use of force is justified to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. Wow. Now, that's a lot. That is, yeah. And, you know, it, 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 it's heretical to mention it because 2020 was such an unusual year. But the fact remains that the, the disorder of 2020, Black Lives Matter and Antifa, and they had their reasons. And, you know, it was a complex, social, very tense situation. But those periods of disorder played a part in this, too. Yeah. You know, and it's idle to deny it yeah yeah so so i think i mean i actually i do agree with the, the argument that the evangelical christian right and the neo-nazi spectrum it's sort of pulsing uranium ore in all of this yeah. but it isn't just the problem is it's not just goodies and baddies this i mean there are goodies and baddies but the the atmosphere of polarization and uh violent rhetoric and a kind of hysteria yeah is is cross party yeah and i think that this presents all problems for kamala harris and tim waltz I mean, tim waltz posted after the attempt perfectly decent thing to say he said uh, this is uh, harris's running mate um violence has no place in our country it's not who we are as a nation well that's a well, nice thing to say but well, it's also 100 percent <laughs> bullshit it's Plainly, it is what yeah, you are yeah, as a yeah. nation. And yeah. I think the problem that, that Harris and Waltz have now, A, Trump is the story again. And B, how do they respond to this? I mean, you cannot run a joy, turn the page, that's all behind us argument when your opponent is being routinely shot at. Yes, it's a it, problem. Yeah. It makes you look ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you cannot. Run. Also, Matt, the other thing, the other response, which I thought I looked at immediately, and I thought, oh, you absolutely evil tosser, which was Elon Musk's hmm. tweet, where he, I can't remember the exact words, but it he was basically was, stuff. He, the, he, what he was implying was that no one's even bothering to shoot he at said, Harris, and no one is even trying to assassinate biden kamala right okay so so and I thought, oh God, how much lower is this guy going to go? But he has a he is making a point he, i'm not saying he has a point but he is making a point that will resonate yes. with loads and loads of people which so, is that there's only one guy that is worth assassinating that, that's right he's the danger why is he a danger because he's a threat to all of the establishment you know i mean i think this, it's a funny there's a funny thing in 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 modern politics which is 
it's always said if you're explaining you're losing right right but i also think that if you're being talked about you're sort of winning yeah <laughs> right? yeah not quite if you're being shot at then if you must being have something out, to right you know, what is it that they're trying to, to stop, stop? Yeah, yeah because yeah. trump's whole argument in this campaign since the first indictment has been i'm they're trying to get at you the voters yeah they're trying to do terrible things to you and i'm standing in in between them you that's know, right he I said am, that didn't he yeah he has said that in terms i'm yeah. the human shield between them the deep state migrants the liberal elite the that's fake right. news all of the usual bad bad forces and good americans and i think you saw in springfield ohio this very unfortunate town that became has become the center of of um of an awful furore since the debate yeah and a very good example of this which is this this was this was the town which led trump to say in the debate they're eating cats they're eating dogs yeah and initially this sort of prompted a whole flurry of jolly memes and cartoons and um songs and dances yeah. and and rightly so because it's good to lampoon and they being the haitian immigrants they being the haitian yeah, yeah, yeah. migrants to springfield yeah, and yeah. it's true that a, a large number of them uh, about 15,000 have gone to Springfield, Ohio in the last few years. Although it, it's really important to emphasize that they have done so, A, legally, because they're here with a protected status. Um, and secondly, at the instigation of the city authorities and local employers who are desperately looking for labor. Correct. Now, that has put some strain on local public services, as is always the case. But what the, the Magalot never mentioned is that Haitians are also paying property taxes and income taxes and yeah. sales taxes yeah. so th this this is awful and there is not a scintilla of proof in it uh, but where did it come from it, it i think it starts in july on july the 9th when vance mm. senator on the senate banking committee raises the question out of the blue of the housing crisis in springfield and then the next day at a national conservative conference he does it again and he uses it as an example of his pet claim that America is not an idea, it's a nation, which is code for it's white and Christian yeah. rather than multicultural. And and as we said, just we were just chatting before we started this, Vance is the guy who is turning out to Vance, be the dark, dark player he is, in this. He's a terrible public performer, yeah. but he is a very, very astute choreographer. And what happened then was that during August, Springfield attracted a, a lot of extremely nasty paramilitary neo-Nazi types. And suddenly, the whole thing just acquired a life of its own. And in August, late August, at a meeting of the, I think, the, 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 the town council, city council, not at one of the neo-Nazis, but a, a, a guy who was running for mayor, said that he'd seen Haitian citizens stealing ducks. Yeah. And then we were off to the races from uh, from the local parks because suddenly every person on Facebook was saying, I hear they steal cats. Yeah, And there was uh, video footage of a woman in a, a, a town 170 miles away, a very disturbed woman obviously um, tried torturing and eating a cat, very disturbing footage, but nothing to do with Springfield. Right. And a guy in Columbus, Ohio, holding... A, a goose which turned out to be just carrying roadkill right for, di for disposal and all this melded into this idea that haitians who have this association racist association with voodoo and the mm -hmm. occult and in, in the american mind were going after your cats and dogs yeah yeah and trump ran with it and it it has dominated the news in america yeah for all i mean ever since the debate yeah and, and and meanwhile, the the substance of the politics of this election is is going by the yes. wayside. So two it? two two main effects of that that campaign. One, um, Springfield has become an unbearable place to live. That there have been bomb threats, school closures, university closures, hospitals on lockdown. You know, uh, march near Nazi marches on Saturday. Haitians living in fear. And also we should point out that in the United States, there's a 
big population of Haitian descendants. Oh, yeah, yeah. Who were uh, all left under uh, Papa Doc Duvalier yes. and Baby Doc. And so so it's not just like the like a sudden new influx of people no, who are totally no, no, aliens no, 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 to the US. No. And right. even those that have arrived recently are there under this temporary status that is yeah. completely legal. Yeah. You know, yeah. So this is not a legality issue at yeah. all. This is a cultural issue. And they've had their houses vandalized, their cars burnt, acid thrown on their property. It's truly horrific. So real life consequences. Yeah. Second, as you said, it's completely skewed the, the post-debate debate. Yeah. Because... Who's talking about Kamala Harris's opportunity economy now? Yeah. Who's talking about what Kamala Harris has got planned for Israel, Gaza or Ukraine? No, absolutely nobody. Yeah. Everyone is talking about cats and dogs in Springfield. So who, Matt, who are the mugs, i.e., I know the answer to this, it's us, the media. Everyone. Who allows the narrative to be so gravitationally pulled away from what's important. I mean, the the problem I mean, there is. Or no, is this what's important? This? Well, you see, I think Trump is an instinctive politician. He doesn't think things through, but I think Vance does. Mm. I think what Vance wanted to do was he has realised that the rock solid, dead sir issue for the for the ticket, the Republican ticket at this election, is the is immigration, but he doesn't want to limit it to the border. Mm -hmm. He wants to make it. He may, make Americans in their towns feel under yes, siege. Like it's a virus. Like it's a virus, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And MAGA is all about siege. It's all about the idea that, you know, you live in your house, but around there are all these menacing forces, yeah. whether it's migrants or woke yeah. teachers or drag queens yeah. or fake news or wh yeah. whatever it may fascist, be. Fascist, fascist populist playbook. It's an absolute blood and soil playbook, right? Yeah. And what he has done is, is use the sort of, memes of cats and dogs and Trump, you know, cuddling, the AI generated images of Trump cuddling yeah. cats and dogs as a sort of vector to get people to talk about migration mm. and to stop talking about turning a page and how well she did in the debate. Now, I don't know whether that will uh, change anyone's vote well i don't think it will and i think but you know, i think it might it might encourage people who were wondering whether they were going to bother to turn out for trump yeah. to turn out i think what what has been and this you know this is a broader symptom i think of the the, the way the 21st century is playing out is that people's attention span is becoming less and less people's desire and need for drama high drama to make them focus on something is becoming greater it's and greater. It's just dopamine hits. It's dopamine hits, one after the other. And so the the two assassination stories absolutely play into that. Fantastic. The the, the comedy drama of cats and dogs and the and the, you put that in the same bracket as sharks and electric boats and all of this kind of stuff. It's Trump going off on a random one. Now you've isolate, identified Vance Yes, very handily driving a sinister subtext under that, but I bet you most people are just sitting there thinking, "Oh, I'd sooner listen to something to the news about Donald Trump than listen to the other guys, the good guys, talk about how they're going to fix the economy." Yeah, and that, and that is tragic for us all. It That's is really tragic, and and the problem is that as brilliantly as Harris did in the debate, her her brilliance was mostly an attack on Trump. Yeah. What hasn't come through yet is what the hell she's going to do. Yeah, and she needs. She hasn't. One criticism that's being leveled against yes. her now, and which is absolutely reasonable, is that she's not out there enough. No, she's not. And she's not. You know, you see, Trump and Vance are out there all the time. Vance, you can't. You can't turn on, on the TV without without seeing him. There. Yes. And where where is she on TV? You know, she needs to be out there, getting the message across all the time. You know. See, I, I I'm what worried me in terms of wanting Harris to win on November the 5th was that I thought, right, there's a play here, which is instead of just saying thoughts and prayers, you know, this is not who we are. Yeah. Violence is bad. Yeah, we, we know. Right. Yeah. She should have taken or she should have emphasized her executive authority and kinetic energy on Sunday night and said, right, this is this is unacceptable. You know, no matter what my disagreements with the former president, we can't be having this. Right. Yeah. So 
I've spoken to President Biden, and this is what's going to happen. And There's going to be a ring of steel around Announce Trump, a yeah. ring of steel, yeah. right? And that makes her look like she's ahead of the curve. Yeah, exactly. She's the presidential figure. Yeah. But it, all that's happened is that they've all sent these Clinton card <laughs> tweets, right, yeah, saying, yeah. get well soon, Donald, you know. Yeah. And he's the one who's being photographed with his MAGA hat at Mar-a-Lago. Yeah with the Speaker of the House, Grinning with away, the thumbs up, thumbs you know, up, yeah. who's in charge, who's dominating the narrative again, yeah. answer Donald Trump. Now, that doesn't mean that three days from now, when we record our Friday podcast, she might be back in the driver's seat. I don't know. Yeah. But what's certain is that this is, it's not over in this sense. You know, clearly almost nothing makes any difference to the polarization of the American Republic. So I suspect this will be decided by who can get their voters off the sofa. Right. I think you're absolutely right. I said to you earlier, um, Anthony Scaramucci, who does another podcast. Yeah. The rest is politics. Uh, USA US, with Katie Kay. Exactly. Was saying, you know, they were saying a sort of mea culpa where, you know, we thought that that assassination photograph, the fight, fight, yep. fight, the, would change everything. And it changed a lot because it put Biden out of the race, as you very brilliantly mm. identified. And we did in our front cover with the headline, the bullet hit Trump, but it killed Joe Biden. Mm. That was absolutely right. But it hasn't really moved the needle in terms of who's no. going to win this election. It, it's become yesterday's news very, very quickly. Yes. Now, the debate, he uh, Scaramucci was saying, he thinks the same is going to be true of the debate. That will become totally ephemeral and will have not moved the needle at all so it's almost like can you stay in the game long enough without screwing up badly enough and to your yes. point can you convince enough wavering people and and you know we're talking about a hundred thousand people who are going to decide tiny numbers this this uh, election. absolutely a hundred thousand people in a handful numbers. of states tiny are going numbers. to decide this and the intensity of the marketing on there yeah. is going to be massive one bad piece of news for kamala harris is that apparently registrations for new democrats have dried up a lot bizarrely uh you would have expected even with it. the taylor swift effect even with the taylor swift effect that's interesting they've gone down donations went up after the yeah 47 debate, million dollars but yeah. but then it's it, it's gone away uh very quickly the, the, uh, and and some interesting distinctions there was a, a, a YouGov poll last week which showed that 55 percent of people thought that harris had handily won the debate but gave trump illogically but that was what they said the lead on all the key issues yeah right now i i can't unpack that other than to say that that, that there's a distinction people are now drawing between kind of sensible talk and symbolic leadership and what she hasn't yet really established and to be fair to her she's had a very very compressed time frame to introduce herself as a presidential candidate rather than yeah. you know vice presidents who are hidden in a box usually but she hasn't really established herself yet as the candidate for what yeah. you know turning the page good felon versus prosecutor good you know, uh, freedom versus tyranny, good. But it, there has to be more than that. There yeah. has to be uh, an explanation as to why she's different to Biden. Yeah. Why is she the change candidate? And every time she makes some gains, something happens <laughs> that destabilizes that. And uh, my, my concern for the, the, the harris Waltz ticket is that I think after the, the, the convention, though they, they would have never articulated this, I think they thought we might well have this sewn up. You know, this the convention was so good mm -hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. Not a beat missed. And then the debate happened, not a beat missed. You can't blame them for feeling that they were winning. Yeah. And yet, the, the polls really aren't shifting outside the margin of error. It all depends where people are looking, doesn't it? It if all depends where on, people are looking. If they're looking on social media, then right. Trump is going to dominate yeah. that conversation yes and 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 as he's demonstrated in the most grotesque fashion he and vance with this truly horrible cats and dogs haitian yeah. springfield story yeah they know how to they know how to run a really nasty campaign so what harris and waltz have to have to do now i think is get out there
yeah and play some shots 100 percent. because just being nice coach waltz just being a, a charming impression i mean you know look she obviously deserves to win on any rational basis but we're talking about the election, not a rational basis. That's, that's the key point. You know this you know, phrase that everyone keeps going on about, facts don't care about your feelings. Yes. Well, yeah, all right. but Feelings, feelings don't care, don't care feelings, about your facts. Feelings trump facts yes, every, every bloody time. time. Right. Every time. Every time. And the problem is that Trump, for many, many years, long before he was a politician, has been a master an instinctive master of manipulating people's feelings. I said, you know, there's a, there was a tiny clip. I wasn't really going to mention this because I'm going to say something now, which, which will people will think I'm an idiot. But there was a tiny little clip on Twitter, two or three days ago, where, and it, all it was was some Trump spotting somebody he knew in a in a crowd, and he he smiles and he makes a sort of funny. And it's this is where I think people will think, oh, shut up. But he makes a very cool little hand gesture. He points, he turns up his thumb to say hello, and he mm. points again, and then he smiles at this person. And it is a winning, charming smile. And, I, you know, you watch it, and you see something, you see some charm in there. And I, I was hating myself because I was watching it thinking, that's funny, that. That's, not, that's good. He looks good when he does that. He looks cool and he looks charming and funny, and I was hating myself for feeling that because I knew that I, I, no, I, 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 I can rationalise beyond that. But lots of other people I, will just I, go, I, "That's I, my I, guy." I, I think that's the key. And the other thing is that he has that sort of indomitability that you saw in some of the first generation of Soviet leaders. They're unkillable, <laughs> you know. Yeah. They're just they, they seem yeah. to be two hundred foot tall. Yeah. Uh, they de they dominate the skyline, yeah. you know, and there's no logic to it, but they appeal to the most primal emotions there are. Yeah. And here's the, the, the challenge that Harris, Waltz and indeed the rest of the world face is it's not enough just to say that's silly. No. It's not enough just to say, yeah, but you're wrong. Yeah. And also the, the flip side, which is more bad news for Kamala Harris, is that America is a much more sexist country it's than very sexist. the UK is. For it's sure. very racist. Um, you know, to be fair to her, I, I don't think you can, uh, apart from the fact that she's been so um, absent from interviews and podcasts and so on, which I think is a, that's been a big mis mistake. Um, she hasn't really put a foot wrong since yeah. Biden stood down. Um, but she's going to have to do better. Yeah. You know, if she wants to be president, and I think she does, I think she's, I think she's hungry for it. Which I hope is, so, it yeah. No, I think it's real. I, I think she really is. And Democrats, you can always Democrat candidates, you can always tell just by looking at them. Does this person really, really want to win? And she really, really wants to win. Yeah. So she's now got. She's now presented with yet another configuration of adverse circumstances. And the question is: Is she nimble enough? Is she brutal enough? to st step up to the plate and do what's necessary. Yeah, but that creates problems. In a sexist society... Yeah, it does. That creates problems. It does. Where suddenly people are looking at her saying, oh, she needs to get back in her box. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, it, 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 is, it is an extraordinarily difficult mm. challenge, this. I mean, you know, and so much hangs on it. You know, the, it's, it, it's interesting the way that Ukraine has been dragged into this by yeah. the fact that this, this guy who, who was trying to uh, shoot Trump yesterday, or, or rather Sunday, w w was obsessed by ukraine because it reminded me a bit of um the the involvement of cuba in the jfk assassination you yeah know, the, there are always these figures who bring in who drag in yeah. foreign policy issues and you know zelensky must have when he heard that uh, a, a pro-ukrainian oh, uh, oh, oh, oh come on yeah, you know yeah um so that's sort of yeah i mean that's delighted the anti-ukraine maga base yeah, you know, we told you so. Not only is this a stupid war to get involved with, but look at the lunatics that are it's gonna, involved with. Yeah, it's going to. So take that you know, that's yeah. another implication. We said it after the debate. It's not over. No, I well, listen. Honestly, if someone, <laughs> if it was tomorrow, I'd say Trump wins. If it was tomorrow, Trump would win. Yeah, but but by next week, it might be completely different. Um, the kind of volatility of it actually is is slightly scary. Yeah. Because a lot hangs on this. 
But the, I mean, this is everything hangs on this. Isn't this now our world where volatility yes. is 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 the volatility is the only constant. It is the only constant. It is the is only that constant. There's no constant. There are no constants, and uh, you know, you the problem is that liberals tend not really to believe that they say it but they don't really believe it and the, the first truly successful liberal statesman of the 21st century would be the one who absolutely gets that and buys into it well i'll tell you who that isn't keir it's Starmer. not keir Starmer yet it's def and it's not ed davey yet well but we'll give ed davey a report card, shall we, when we come back from a yes, break? Yes, let's, right. let's give Sir Ed a bit of a yeah, report okay. card. All right, back in a minute. Back in a minute. Right, so it's the Lib Dem conference in Brighton. It is. And, you know, it's interesting because I remember, I was thinking back this morning to a lunch I had with Ed Davey uh, towards the end of the coalition. He was... a uh, energy secretary then and he was a broken man you yeah. know he, you could tell he'd had a terrible time miserable what's hate, he like as a person of, oh he's extremely affable i mean yeah. what you see on tv is what you, what he's like yeah. but he hadn't really enjoyed it and he i think he intuited correctly that the lib dems were going to get a kicking in the 2015 general election which <laughs> he indeed, wasn't wrong he wasn't that. wrong there yeah. and i think he was sort of thinking is this it you know so he, he he sticks with it and and um he stands in uh, 2019 and joe swinson beats him but then he uh, then he becomes the leader yeah and what do you know fantastic result yeah. in the in the election and in he July. had an amazing election didn't he I exactly mean, i mean he really uh, did because i remember before the election uh, the, the sense was where is he who is he who it's is a he? massive disappointment what, they, they are completely irrelevant. And now, though, on the other side of the election, after a brilliant campaign, they are more relevant than ever before. Probably. Yes. I mean, I think that in modern politics, I mean, the first thing is that I think he shows that contrary to sort of received wisdom, politicians can evolve. Yeah. You know, I think Ed Davey is, has evolved quite significantly in the last decade. Yeah. And he's he's been examining the rise of populism and also the challenge of progressivism and drawn some very astute conclusions because you know going up to 72 seats that's the i mean it's by some margin the highest that the lib dems have ever had and it's the biggest that the liberals have had since asquith so it's yeah. a pretty astonishing achievement yeah. you know and they're second in 27 seats in addition so they you know they're looking yeah. at a ratcheting up i mean they you know it is conceivable now that they might overtake the Tories as the, the main party of opposition. Yes. But more to the point, even though they don't have as many MPs as the Tories who have 100, 121, they are actually much more interesting as a party of, of, of constructive criticism, as they like to say. Yeah. Well, and one topic they're definitely more interesting on, uh, for better or worse, is Europe. Oh, miles better. Now, he was on the radio this morning talking about how he thought that Keir Starmer had made a massive mistake in ruling out membership of the single market as we're about to go into negotiations. Matt, so, as far as I'm concerned, big tick. Yeah. Right? But my question to Ed Davey would be, why are the Liberal Democrats not explicitly pro-rejoin at this point? Why are they... Yeah. Given that their constituency are 100% yes. anti-Brexit... Um, why are they not establishing themselves as the absolute gung-ho pro-remain rejoin party? Well, I, I mean, I, I think they should. But, mm. but I, I guess their argument would be that they have lots of other things that they want to say. Mm -hmm. And if they became the rejoin party, that would be all anyone ever talked about right. about them. But I, I agree with you. I think that, that, that actually the, 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 the net benefit of being just explicitly look this yeah. guys this has been a disaster let's rejoin and it would be less you see saying let's rejoin the let's rejoin the single market what does that actually mean to the average voter yeah you know, it doesn't mean anything it's yeah. it's a good idea better that than not but what you want from him is i think i think that what's interesting about the lib dems is two things the first is that they are where at one nation toryism no longer exists it just doesn't. It's not the Conservative Party doesn't have a one nation wing. But 
the kind of spirit that it, that it represented has gone into the Lib Dems, as they showed with their success in the so-called Blue Wall. But at the same time, which is sort of a contradiction, but that's politics, they're well set to be the conscience of the Labour Party. Yeah. And this I like yeah. because, you know, they they are they I think they're going to be important in the, the the debate we were talking about the other day about the NHS, because I think that they, you know, their argument, no, you need investment. You can't just wait, have reform first and then investment. We need investment now. Yeah. And particularly, and it's a subject that's, very, as we know, very close to Ed Davies' heart, on social care. You know, they are they really are driving that argument quite hard. And I think that's terribly important because I don't think the Tories will be any use on that at all. No. I mean, how, I, how will they, man literally though, how will they manage to influence the debate? Well, I think that what they're, for, what have they done as a start of a 10? They've called for a cross-party commission. Now that's a bit meh, you know. But what it's trying to do is say, we can't just keep kicking the, this can down the road. And they'd be very intelligent, I think, about saying, well, what about the Scottish model? You know, where if you're um, over 65, it's free. Uh, and if you are a child and disabled, it's free. And it, they, they say it costs about between two and three billion. Some people say it costs more. But the point that they make, which is absolutely spot on, is that it reduces costs on the NHS, a social care system that worked would yeah. be, and we've got, to, we've got to nail this one somehow. And it's been endlessly discussed you know, the last time there was a cross-party uh, attempt, it was Andy Burnham was the health secretary 10 wow. years ago, you know. Yeah. So I don't know whether there'll be a cross-party commission, but I do think as a, as a sort of, as an opening bid, that's quite good. Yeah. What will probably then happen is that Reeves's budget will be disappointing on social care. And Ed Davey will try and put water blue red water between where streeting and reeves on this issue and say look you know are we going to get an answer yeah i don't know whether i mean it's hard because when a government has as big a majority as starmers you can't force it to do anything no. but what you can do and he's getting very canny at he's he's become very surprisingly an extremely good communicator now you know people say Oh, you know, how daft that he's still doing the, the stunts. You know, he arrives at Brighton on a jet ski on Saturday. But everyone liked it. Everyone talked about of it. Of course, yeah. You know, I don't know. I I think that yeah. it's a good start. Well, I think also, and we've said this before, but I think Labour need to be very aware that the volatility we spoke about yes. in, in America is absolutely as applicable 100%. here. 100%. And as much as they won a huge landslide, the British public are so fed up right now with disappointment and lack of delivery that if they're not conspicuously pleasing and delivering yeah then that volatility could come and bite them on the backside super quick the other thing i like about the lib dems is they're unapologetically in favor of the things that need to be done yeah so they say yeah we do need big measures on climate change and yeah we do need to spend more on the nhs and yeah we do need to sort out social care and these are big the big 21st century issues yeah. now the tories are having an argument about how much smaller the state should be. That's that's their irrelevant argument. They're yeah. they're just away with the fairies. I mean, yeah. they're irrelevant. But having a a party in the Commons with a pretty significant heft to it, let's put it no more than that. S saying to Labour, hang on a minute, you know, you're supposed to be a progressive government. What are you doing on social care? What are you doing yeah. on the NHS? Yeah. When is the climate change revolution coming? Yeah. You know, when is the 21st century starting? Yeah. I'm all for it. I, li I like your phrase about them being the conscience of the Labour Party, I think. I mean, you it's know. It's very necessary. It's, it's odd, isn't it? Because yeah. we start, you know, uh, only uh, 14 years ago, they were the conscience of the Conservative Party in a coalition yeah. government. Uh, well, indeed, they, they carried on until 2015. So it's only nine years ago. But actually now I think they may be in a more constructive position. Yeah. And certainly more punchy. You know. Yes. And and we need that. And, you know, it, it's a good corrective to the sort of technocracy and doorness of Keir Starmer, I think. I also think that Ed Davey 
looks and sounds like the right man to put Nigel Farage into yes. into perspective. Yeah, it's you know, very, as it, a tin pot little noise making populist. He, Davey can play that role. He's bigger and he's more sensible, and he's got but he's got the common touch. He has that Farage and, tries to. And you know what? Use. He didn't ten years ago. Yeah, and that's what's so fascinating to me is that he's grown into yeah. this very impressive politician who's doesn't take himself so seriously but takes the issues very seriously well he's a he's a popular politician versus a populist politician well Farage, i mean you know it we, here we get into the the sort of the weeds of definition but if there is a left-wing populist around or center-left populist around it's ed davy not yeah, keir starmer yeah. Talking to Keir Starmer, we can't let the podcast finish before commenting on these donations from Lord Ali, from Wahid Ali. Yeah, um, I mean... What do, you, what do you make of it? I think it's terrible. Mm. Um, it's a bad look, isn't it? It's terrible because uh, it's it's terrible to hear someone as astute as David Lammy on the media round on Sunday saying, oh, well, in other countries, you know, uh, politicians and their wives have a, a clothing allowance. Mm. I mean... You know, the Starmers are not short of a few bob. Yeah. And, you know, let's face it, when Boris Johnson and Carrie, you know, were wallpapering the Downing Street flat and going up, to, yeah. getting up to all we, sorts. We were them, going nuts about We were that. going crazy about it, yeah. you know, and rightly so. And Starmer's, part of Starmer's promise was, I will restore trust. Yeah. And I will be, you know, Caesar's wife must be above suspicion, literally in this yeah. case. And I think that, um, you know, taking money from a Labour donor to clothe the uh, leader of the opposition as then was and now wife of the prime minister is a, a very, very bad thing to do when you are taking the winter fuel allowance away yeah. from lots of pensioners. And I, I know, you know, people will say, but he's so nice or she's so nice. And that, again, is what makes me worry, which is it doesn't matter whether they're nice. I'm sure they are. Also, the other thing is, Matt, that why I, I think Wahid Ali's brilliant, you know, yeah, yeah, brilliant businessman. That's not uh, the point. That, but the, uh, in fact, the point is that he's a very, very wealthy media elite yes. guy. And if you want somebody in the northeast of England to look down at Westminster and say it's the same bloody racket, it's then just do that. It's the do same. That, it's the same you know? racket with the red rosette. Yeah. You know what have we done? We've replaced one elite yeah. with blue rosettes with another with red rosettes. Now, actually, yeah. I don't think we have. And this is why I'm angry with Starmer. Is that I don't think he's Ben, you know, I don't think yeah. he's a crooked character at all. I don't think he's crooked here, but I do think he's uh, thoughtless and heedless here. And I think also, I mean, look, we've we've had loads. By the way, you don't necessarily know this, but we've had an inbox recently where there's been an increasing number of emails from people saying, "Why are you giving Starmer such a hard time? You know, you guys are meant to be centre left, you know, and all of this business." And we are. I am for sure, you know, and I want Labour to. Do all of the things I we've been begging out. them to do and for it to be a massive success. But there are conspicuous missteps here already that need addressing. And it would be dishonest of us not yeah. to say what we thought about them. And I do think the idea that Keir Starmer's taken 50 grand, 50,000 quid, yes. right, of money from a multi, multi millionaire media guy who has the run of 10 Downing Street. And is, you know, is a Labour lord and all of this business, but has the run of 10 Downing Street and has given 300,000 at least of his own money to the campaign. OK, fine. And has led the fundraising campaign. Fine. But to take 50,000 quid in personal donations and to spend thousands on spectacles and suits and your wife's clothing alterations... I mean, anybody, anybody normal. I was up in Liverpool at the weekend. Any scouser We're just looking at that would think, are you off your head? I know. To those who say we should be backing him. No, you know, not that's not the job of any yeah. no, newspaper, absolutely, yeah. I, I, irrespective of its uh, inclinations. You know, New European has very strong views. and But, th but th that doesn't mean that. Uh, we're client journalists. Sorry, no, no. you know, no. There's enough for them about. Yes, yeah. and also we're not. You know, we, you can't complain about Tory pro post truth. Yeah, and then say, ah, oh, but you, you should you should go easy on Labour. Sorry, that's not how it's going to be. And yeah. also, the bottom line reason for it is the stakes are too important. Yeah, because we've had 14 years of of Tory rule 
which have ended in complete disaster for the country. We really need this to work. Mm. And part of that is that Labour really has to have its act together on things like trust. Yeah. The, and, you know, the, the, the most hurtful part of the whole thing, and I did sort of feel a sense of hurt in, was the response where Starmer said, well, I've asked the question, you know, is it, do I have to disclose these things? It's like, if, you're, if you've got to ask civil servants about whether or not you have to disclose gifts to your wife's yes. wardrobe, th does that not send you th the alarm bells ringing in your head that there's something wrong here? It's funny because David Cameron's finest hour, and you know... <laughs> and there was just the one. The one maybe it was just the one. <laughs> but was during the parliamentary expenses row. He said, I don't care what the rules say. It's just wrong. Yeah, right, right. Right? And that was, I think that was when he was at his absolute... That's right. His radar were at their keenest. Yeah. Was he understood that this was not about the letter of the rules or, you know, speaking to the officials and saying, is this okay, is it not? It was about political and moral antennae and going, oh, this is a bit it's off. It's about your moral compass, isn't yes, it? Yes, and... and, and Starmer has a big enough majority that, at least under traditional rules, he might well be in for a decade. You can't start with stuff like this. You know, he has to make it absolutely clear to the public because he's not going to have very much to offer them. And I thought before, you know, for various reasons, partly informed by things that people around him had said, and then also Gordon Brown had done a very good thing on um, the Constitution and trust and so on, that one of the things he was going to do that was zero cost practically was really clean up politics. Yeah. Okay. Now, how can you clean up politics and restore public trust when you're doing something like that? Yeah. If you can't see that, then we're in trouble. Well, this, I mean, you know, not to labour the point too much, excuse the pun, but if you imagine the conversation yes. between those two men where one very wealthy man has said, Keir, you should get some very expensive spectacles. I'll pay for them. And the response isn't, Wahid, well, we've got bigger fish to fry than my You're glasses. really kind, but I've got to be Thank so you. careful. I, Thank honestly, you. I wouldn't imagine if it got out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, there are the stories which are not necessarily huge stories, mm. but they're frighteningly revealing. Yeah. This is one of them. Uh, yeah. You know, in a way, it's more revealing to me than the winter fuel allowance story because of the winter fuel allowance story. I can hear the debates that led to it. Yeah, I think it's a mistake, but I can hear, you know, we've got to be fiscally responsible, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But this is just stupidity. But also, I can't get away from the feeling that it must have been done in the hope that it was never going to come out. Well, that's even worse, that's, isn't it? And that's what's, that is what is biting me and yes. making me feel sick about it. Is I remember, not to get too couthy about this, but my dad always said to me when I was a very young kid, don't ever nick anything or dodge a train fare or whatever. He said he once was on a bus and he saw a bus conductor kick a guy off on a full bus because he said, last time I saw you and you never paid your six pence, right? Yeah. And the and the guy the hum, humiliation yeah and it was just a very simple decency point pay your way do the right thing be honest just be honest and don't ever do anything where if somebody said to you we've found this out then you would feel a sense of shame and that's what's happened and the worst thing as we know in the modern world for a politician is the appearance of phoniness and inauthenticity yeah and Keir Starmer spent the whole of the election campaign emphasizing his working class roots saying quite legitimately he was the son yeah. of a tool maker yeah all that was he do you know I, apparently <laughs> I, I i'll have to double check it don't hold me to that he doesn't like it when you laugh about it we he knew, doesn't we like it when you laugh well, about yeah. it but yeah. you know yeah. So that was that was the that was the that was the offer to the yeah. country. I'm yeah. like you. Yeah. You know, I know that I look I know I've got a knighthood and I know I've gone middle class and all the rest of it, but actually my origins are like yours. So I understand what what you what you're going through. Then to say and by the way, part of being prime minister is I get free clobber, yeah. right? Yeah. Not good. No, not good. All right, so sorry to disappoint sorry, all Keir. those who want a Kia cheerleading session on the two mats. Kia simpering, as our friend, well, new friend Andy Kirpo would put it. Yeah, yeah. We won't be we doing any that's not what we are. simpering to anybody, no. I'm afraid. Sorry. We say it as we say we'll it. We'll cheer him when he does something great. Thank you for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the show. Um, please do remember to subscribe to The New European. This show is not possible without 
the benevolence of subscribers. So join them. Uh, you can sign up from just one pound a week when you go to the new european.co.uk forward slash two mats. That's the number two M A T T S. You will find the newspaper every bit as candid and honest, and I hope as interesting as you find this podcast and witty. And well, I didn't dare stuffed say stuffed with wit. Didn't dare say we've got a very funny cover this week. It, look out for it. It will it, make you chuckle, folks. When look out for it when it hits the shelves on on Thursday. Subscribers get theirs early on a Wednesday. Are just another reason to join. Very poor taste. Very poor taste. These people. <laughs> they have I no said idea. to them, "Why do they do this?" I said, "Why do they do it?" <laughs> Email in your feedback or your comments, unless you want to tell us to kiss up to Keir we won't be doing that don't bother emailing about that but any other feedback and uh, comments to 2 mats at tnepublishing.com that's the number 2 m-a-t-t-s at tnepublishing.com thank you as ever to our team at Rethink Audio led this week by Ollie Peart and uh, we will see you on, on Friday on Friday have, have a, a great week have an amazing week enjoy <laughs>